little bit to have Dr. Michael Shermer speak. Dr. Shermer is executive director of the Skeptic Society. He's the founder and editor of Skeptic Magazine and a regular col columnist, excuse me, for Scientific American. Previously, he taught psychology, evolution, and history of science as a professor at Occidental College and Cal State Los Angeles for nearly 20 years. He is the author of several books, and his latest is called The Believing Brain, From Ghosts and Gods to Politics and Conspiracies, How We Construct Beliefs and Reinforce Them as Truths. Dr. Shermer has shown tremendous range as a presenter by appearing on TV shows including The Colbert Report, Oprah, and Charlie Rose. He is here today to discuss the problem of tribalism, which we inherited from our primate ancestors and which we must overcome to achieve a stable and just global society. Please welcome Dr. Michael Shermer. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. How are we doing? So I'm the publisher of this skeptic magazine. We investigate claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, fringe groups, and cults of claims of all kinds between good science, junk science, bad science, voodoo science, pathological science, non-science, and plain old nonsense. <laughs> and unless you've been, thank you, unless you've been abducted by aliens and been on Mars for the last few decades, you know there's a lot of it out there. Nonsense, that is. Some people call us debunkers, but let's face it, there's a lot of bunk that needs debunking, and that's our job. On the other hand, we also want to understand why people believe these things and how beliefs come to be formed. This is one of our issues. I, I brought this one in particular just to show you uh, that uh, we did one on the future of intelligence. Uh, are people getting smarter or dumber? By the way, uh, those of you in the back who can't see that, it's right uh, there. Okay, so I'll just use this one. <laughs> uh, well, I'm from Southern California, so I have an opinion about this myself. Um, but it turns out people are getting smarter. There's a so-called Flynn effect. IQ scores are going up about three points every 10 years for the last 90 years or so. Uh, on the abstract reasoning portion of the IQ test, which is good news because that's scientific way of thinking. And I'm going to end with that later on, so I'll come back to that. I should note, because I know a lot of you are expecting me to be Mr. Skeptic here about the singularity. So I will say a few remarks about my skepticism of some of the claims of the singularity. Somebody asked me last night at the dinner, what's my position on, on immortality? <clears throat> I said, I'm for it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Who wouldn't be? But uh, here's my fear, that you guys are going to figure out this immortality thing right after I die. I'm going to be so pissed. <laughs> I'm just going to just miss it. <clears throat> I am skeptical in this sense that uh, I got the sense r watching Ray Kurzweil's film, um, The Transcendent Man, uh, because so much of this is uh, w whenever a prophet says that the next big thing is going to happen now in our generation, his generation, we're the special people, we're the chosen ones, we get to go to the afterlife, the special place, they're always wrong. May 21st, uh, when the world was supposed to end, what happened? May 22nd. Uh, they've recalibrated. You actually have six days to repent for the end is coming on October 21st. And you know, of course, October 22nd is going to come. And then 2012 will come and go without the end of the world. And so that's typically how it goes. So now it could be that we're wrong. The Copernican principle states we're not special. And so I always apply the Copernican principle. We're not special. We're not going to live forever. But I'm happy to be proven wrong. We have to remember in science, the null hypothesis is where we begin. Whatever your claim is, it's not true until you prove otherwise. So, just like any other claim, um, I'm happy to be uh, proven wrong. The regenerative medicine uh, stuff uh, that we heard earlier, this is terrific. I got a kind of a bad hip. I've ridden my bike 300,000 miles in the last 30 years, and, and my hip's going bad. And my Kaiser doc said, no problem, we'll just hack it off and put a new one in. I'm like, Can you think of a better way? Because <laughs> the hacking off part doesn't sound so good. So I'd love to just inject some stem cells in there, and they, and they just pop right up and, and, uh, and, and grow a new uh, whatever that cartilage stuff is in there. Uh, but anyway, so, um, oh, yes, and, uh, and I'm often uh, queried by my theists, debate partners, and my God debates, what would it take to prove to you that there is a God? And I say, for uh, amputees to grow a new limb. Well, it, it appears that... Uh, <laughs> It appears that Dr. Badalak is going to be God. Um, 
All right, let's go to uh, what I want to talk about here on the uh, slides. Okay, uh, did I turn this thing off here? Let's see. This should bring it back on. Okay, there we go. So I want to talk about the social singularity or why things are getting progressively better. This is the plaque from um, the Suez Canal, Epere Terum Gentibus, to open the world to all people. So that's what we want to do. That's what all you engineers and science and techie people are doing, but you're not going to do it unless the social, political, and economic system enables it. So let's see where we've come from that. I call this the, uh, the, the question about the moral arc. Why does the moral arc bend toward justice and freedom? This comes from, of course, Martin Luther King's famous quote, let us realize that the arc of the moral universe is long, but that it bends toward justice. He got this from the 19th century preacher Theodore Parker from his book of Justice and Conscience. I do not pretend to understand the moral universe. The arc is a long one. My eye reaches but little ways. I cannot calculate the curve and complete the figure by the experience of sight. I can divine it by conscience. And from what I see, I'm sure that it bends toward justice. Well, I think it does. It's, it's hard to say that we are in an age of moral progress and social progress in the epoch of the Holocaust. Uh, but in fact, there's lots of reasons to be optimistic. Despite the claims by environmental doomsayers, they're sort of the doppelganger of the religious doomsayers, you know, overpopulation and deforestation and, and, uh, and, and, and global warming and all this stuff, air pollution and whatnot. By the way, that's my city of Los Angeles co uh, now compared to the 1970s. This is where I want to go. Things are actually getting better. I'm working from four books here. Matt Ridley's Rational Optimist, Robert Wright's Non-Zero, Steve Pinker's New, The Better Angels of Our Nature and My Own, The Mind of the Market. I strongly recommend uh, Steve Pinker's new book that just came out last week. It's one of the most important science books I've ever read. Perhaps it's one of the most important, at least, social science books ever written. Uh, so something extraordinary happened in the last 10,000 years as we made the transition from hunter-gatherers to consumer traders. If you walked into a Yanomamo village and counted up all the stone tools and baskets and artifacts and, and things that they used to live, you come up with a figure of about 300. That's the average number of stock-keeping units, as retailers call it, that hunter-gatherers have. If you walked outside into the Manhattan village and counted up all the stock-keeping units, it comes out to about 10 billion. That's a 33 million different uh, factor of, of progress in terms of just products. And then income, the average hunter-gatherer makes $100 per annum per year uh, as it's calibrated by economists. And the average Manhattanite makes about $40,000 per year. This did not happen uh, linearly. That $100 per person per year rose to about $150 per person uh, per year from, let's say, 100,000 years ago to 1,000 years ago. I'm using the 100,000 figure as just a range between that 60,000 and 140,000 uh, estimate from when we migrated out of Africa in the last bottleneck founding effect. We shifted from 150 to $200 per person per year by 1750. So in other words, it took 97,000 years to go from 100 to 150 bucks a person per year and another 2,750 years to get to $200 per person per year and 250 years to get to $6,000 per person per year for the entire world today and $40,000 per person per year for the West. If you compress that 100,000-year period to one year, the last 250-year period of relative prosperity would represent less than one day out of the year. Or if you condense that 100,000 years into one 24-hour day, our epic represents 3.6 minutes. In other words, we're, we're living in the anomaly. So you're going to start to recognize some of these curves that look like uh, Ray's uh, law of accelerating returns, these sort of Moore's law type curves. This is world GDP per capita for the last thousand years uh, for the entire world, up to a little over 6,000 in the year 2000. World GDP per capita uh, between the year one and the year 2003, that one on the far right there, that's the industrial West, England and its offshoots, uh, and then these are uh, some of the other countries around the world there that are slowly starting to climb. Here's growth in real world GDP per capita from 1,000 to the present. That's a 900% growth in real income. We are 900% wealthier than we used to be in, in real, real world dollars. Just Again, just lots of different ways to measure this per capita income in England from 1220 to, to 2000. Real world GDP per capita projected between uh, 20, 2000 and 2030. As people got wealthier, lots of things got better. 
the uh, poverty rate decreased dramatically from over uh, 0.25 to down to just barely above 0.05 when adjusted for inflation between 1970 and 2006. It's the baseline dollar uh, per, per day poverty rate in Africa. Things are still bad. Okay, let me say parenthetically, uh, we're not claiming everything's great, that it's much better. That's the point. The, the, the curves are moving in the right direction. Uh, death rates from water-related diseases have dramat uh, dramatically decreased. Uh, the rates of tuberculosis and mort uh, mortality rates have decreased. Global cereal harvests have increased. How much land do we need to feed every person on Earth? Hunter-gatherers needed that much. Slash and burn needed 10 hectares. 1950s, 4,000 square, me square meters. And then in 2004, just 1,250 square meters. So we're getting better at producing food. Life expectancy at birth, world average, has been dramatically increasing. Uh, the percentage decrease in world population, again, we never, we're never shown the curves after 2050, but the rate of increase is decreasing, and by 2050, as we saw in the previous talk, it'll be below replacement level. And then there'll be all this angst about there's not enough people by the end of the century, and we need to ban birth control and things like this you'll hear, I predict. Fertility, uh, fertility rates have dropped. Uh, again, uh, all, all, the, all these data sets are in those, those four books I provided at the start, and, and many other books as well. The price of light, how many hours you have to work per 1,000 lumen hours have, have dropped dramatically. Again, there's hundreds of ways to measure these rates of progress. Metal prices relative to U.S. wages. Remember Julian Simon's bet with uh, Paul Ehrlich in the 1980s, and, and Simon won all those bets about... Uh, the decrease in precious mineral prices. Air pollutant uh, uh, emissions have dropped dramatically, like in my own city of Los Angeles. We used to have to be done with our training rides by 10 in the morning in the late 70s and early 80s. Now we can ride all day, pretty much all year, without air pollution. Uh, the, even the Gini coefficient, so the, the folks down the road at the uh, Wall Street uh, protests are claiming things are, are un unequal. Yeah, they are unequal. They're never going to be perfectly equal. Uh, however, it's getting better in terms of uh, everybody getting more prosperous. Every boat is, rises on the tide. The Gini coefficient, that's just a, a measure of the difference somewhere between, well, it's going to be somewhere between uh, 1 and 0. So it, it's dropping from 0.68 down here to almost 0.6. So again, it's, there's, still a, there's still inequalities, but the inequalities are decreasing as everybody else gets wealthier. Uh, if you think about King Louis the uh, the 14th and, and and all his servants, hundreds and hundreds of servants, uh, staffing his kitchen and and and, and waiting on him uh, for for everything he needs, you and I all have that now. All you got to do is is just walk down to the local Starbucks. There's a barista waiting there right now for you, you personally, to make you your venti latte. We are all King Louis now, thanks to uh, markets. Life also became much uh, safer. These are uh, homicide rates in Europe per 100,000 from uh, 35 per 100,000 down to, well, barely, it's actually now it's less than one at 2005 figures. Here's violent deaths in prehistoric societies as measured by uh, archaeological sites. That's the average for all those bars to the left. Uh, there is uh, t uh, Europe and the United States in the 20th century by comparison. That's the entire world for the 20th century because it includes all the world wars and it's not even measurable in 2005. Those, those are prehistoric sites. Here are uh, non-state societies living today. That's the average for their homicide rates, violent deaths of all kinds, sorry, uh, compared to 20th century Germany, tw uh, 20th century Russia, 20th century Japan, 20th century US, the entire world in 2005 not even measurable. The world is a much safer place to be, even though you never hear about that on the news. Homicide rates in England have plummeted. Homicide rates in Europe for all countries have plummeted. The abolition of judicial torture has is pretty much completely disappeared, except for maybe in parts of the United States. <clears throat> anyway. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know, we're a little behind the curve on some of these curves, but... We're, make, we're making progress. The abolition of the death penalty in Europe is pretty much completely plunged. Abolition of death penalty for non-lethal crimes. In the 18th century, you could get the death penalty for 
uh, counterfeiting, rob, uh, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, strong evidence of malice in a child aged 17 to 14 years of age. In our own country, you could be executed for theft, sodomy, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, oh, there goes half of Congress, uh, concealing birth, burglary, slave revolt, counterfeiting, horse theft. Other abolitions of the modern uh, period, witchcraft, religious persecution, dueling, blood sports, debtor's prison, slavery. The abolition of slavery is, is uh, it, well, it's pretty much, except for sexual slavery in Southeast Asia, pretty much abolished. Even wars are becoming more civilized. Yes, even in the 20th century, despite that, if you look at the great power wars between 1500 and 2000, the proportion of years that the great powers in Europe spent fighting one another, which used to be pretty much all of the time, one of them was fighting one of them. Now none of them fight each other. The duration of these wars involving great powers has plummeted. The frequency of wars involving great powers has plummeted. The deaths in these wars, except for World War I, World War II, but now there's this great 50-year period of relative peace we have to explain. There have been zero wars between the United States and the USSR. No nuclear weapons have been used since 1946. No wars between the great powers. Imagine France invading Germany now. It's just inconceivable. Uh, zero wars between developed nations. Even genocide in the 20th century has plummeted after that last sort of 40 years. Even throwing in Cambodia and Rwanda, uh, we still see a dramatic decrease there. So what's behind the progress? Let's just go through these fairly quickly. Um, the evolution of our moral emotions. So we start with an evolutionary explanation. Then the creation of the modern state, trade and capitalism, and finally classical liberalism and the civilizing process. This is the formula to make life better basically. So we have to remember that we are a social primate species who spent 99% of our history in small bands of hunter-gatherers of a couple dozen to a couple hundred people, everyone who is either related to one another or knows one another. To that extent, we evolved a dual human nature, a moral nature, in which we are both good and evil. We have a sort of a group amity within our group and a between-group enmity. In other words, we have our inner Oscar Schindler and our inner Amon Goethe. Uh, our inner Colonel Kurtz, or our inner Captain Willard, or as I like to do, talk about it, our, our inner Captain Kirk, the evil Kirk and the good Kirk, you remember, because all life can be explained through science fiction. And, uh, and the enemy within showed that, you know, it was the, the evil Kirk, the high testosterone Kirk, that, that made him a good leader, right? So we have both good and bad within us, as Alexander Solzhenitsyn said in the Gulag Archipelago, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds and it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us um, and destroy them. But the line dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being and who is willing to destroy a piece of his own heart. So we have a dual nature. We are by nature moral and immoral, good and evil, altruistic and selfish, cooperative and competitive, peaceful and bellicose, virtuous and non-virtuous. In other words, we're naughty and nice. It's a data-heavy lecture, so you've got to throw in some others. <laughs> so we evolved. Uh, our first moral principle is that is be nice to your kin and kind. That's your immediate social circle there that you're genetically related to. That's my kin there. Th there, not there. <laughs> uh, and this can be described uh, quite carefully, and the evolutionary theorists have worked this all out, uh, that you're more likely to be nice to yourself and your identical twin and your offspring and your parents than you are to your full cousin or half-sibling or second cousin or third cousin or whatever. So that gets us out of the, 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 the social circle uh, a little ways. The problem is, is that we have a collapse of, collapse, uh, of compassion when there's too many uh, people on the offing uh, for uh, who we want to be compassionate about. This is an experiment on how much money you'll give uh, to an NGO who wants you to uh, help save these starving children in Africa. The research shows that people give more money if you tell them you just have one problem to solve than if you tell them you have a whole bunch of kids. The number of victims, the more the victims that there are, the less money people give. It's, it's a, so it's a trick on our evolutionary psychology for these NGOs to show you a picture of one child uh, and with a little bio. That's, I call that the Indugu effect from About Schmidt, where Jack Nicholson adopts little Indugu because he, he sees him on a commercial late at night, right? That's, that's a powerful effect. So our second moral principle is reciprocity. I'll scratch your back. If you'll scratch mine, this is called, also called reciprocal altruism. This has also been worked out by Bob Trivers, uh, Bill Hamilton, and others in terms of how this can be explained from the bottom up by natural selection. 
Uh, and and that, gets us, that gets us from the baseline of caring most about yourself, your family, and your extended family up into the community and the society. That is, we, we practice reciprocity. So that expands the, the circle of sentiments to include more and more people. This is the long road we've been on for the last 10,000 years is to include more and more people in the circle of who we want to be nice to instead of kill. So the third moral principle, the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, requires empathy, other consideration, and theory of mind. Okay? So where do we get this? Well, think about emotions and why they evolved. When our body is depleted of energy, we don't, we don't compute the caloric input-output ratios. We f- simply feel hungry and seek out food. When we want to pass on our genes to the next generation, we don't calculate the genetic potential of our sexual partner. We just feel aroused and, and seek out sexual intimacy. We know what people find attractive, um, you know, symmetrical faces, clear complexion, uh, broad shoulders and a narrow waist in the men, and, and, a, and a waist-to-hip ratio of 0.67 in women. I mean, no one walks into a nightclub with calipers, you know, like 0.76, no, you're not, ooh, you're so close. Uh, uh, evolution's already done the calculations for us because those are proxies for genetic health. So we are just simply attracted to certain things. Those are our moral, those are basic emotions. And so I, I respond to my theist friends in debates, why should we be moral? They say, well, if you're an atheist, why should you be moral? This is like asking, why should you be hungry? Or why should we be aroused? Or why should we be jealous? Or why should we be in, in love? These, these are all evolved emotions for ultimate deep evolutionary reasons. So the point of society is to tap into those. So, in other words, you can't fake being a moral person. You actually have to be a moral person because people that know you and spend a lot of time with you uh, will catch the cues that you give off. So this is the basis of real morality. You can't fool all the people all the time. You have to actually believe you're a moral person, act like a moral person, be a moral person, and that is morality. That's bottom-up, natural selection given morality. We don't need it from the top down, if you catch my drift. (laughs) <laughs> so I'm going to skip the trolley car problem. The ultimatum game, uh, you know you, 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 your offer at a split, and, and you can make an offer to your partner. If they accept it, you both get to keep the money. If they don't, neither of you gets the money. How much money will you give? Uh, most people offer like a 60-40, 70-30 split, a little on the selfish side, but enough that the other person will accept it. The more exposure subjects have to markets and religion, by the way, the more likely they are to make generous offers. And, uh, and so this shows us that we have a moral nature. We have a sense of what's fair and, and what's not. In games similar to the ultimatum game, where people are allowed to put money into a pot that they then add up and, and share, they privately put a certain amount in that they've given, uh, the temptation to freeload is there, and when there's not an opportunity to punish the freeloaders, the freeloaders end up taking over the game and getting a little edge on the other competitors, and the whole system breaks down and people quit giving. So what we've discovered is that you have to have rules enforcing the games or else people will cheat. So this leads to our second uh, solution, the the Leviathan state. Us libertarians hate number two, but I have to say this is what God has started. (laughs) That is a big state that provided a justice system and, and took over the monopoly on violence so that other people didn't do it. And that eliminated the incentives for exploitative attack. So this all happened um, within about the last three to 5,000 years as bands and tribes began to coalesce into chieftains and states. Uh, And when the populations were too big for these informal means of behavior control to work, everybody got a set of rules. Here's the rules, and if you break them, these are the penalties. That's what the state does. And if you think you got away with it, you didn't because there's an eye in the sky who keeps track of everything, and that's religion. <laughs> so government and religion is, was the two forces. Now, the problem with that top-down state leviathan as a solution to violence is, is a kleptocracy and corruption by the people in charge. So there's a, hopefully we think, I think in the next century or so, we'll find better solutions to these state problems. Liberal democracies is a big step. Number third, trade or the gentle commerce. Plunder is zero-sum. Trade is non-zero. It's win-win. We've been hearing lectures on that already. This is Matt Ridley's uh, sort of sequence of the most important steps in human evolution, bipedalism, tool use, fire, language, and exchange or trade. Uh, As Matt calls it, it's ideas having sex with other ideas. It's a great metaphor. Uh, So international trade has gone up uh, dramatically. The civilizing process, number four, finally to wrap it up. 
Um, uh, Pinker expands upon this greatly in his terrific book uh, upon uh, Norbert Elias's uh, The Civilizing Process. That is, there's been a sort of a bottom-up process of becoming people becoming more civilized through exposure because of trade to other people. The, ex- the circle of sentiments has expanded as you're exposed to other people uh, through travel and trade and so on. You realize that, you know, they're not the enemy. You don't have to kill them. You can actually be nice to them. And in fact, if they make your computer parts, you shouldn't bomb them. <laughs> So there's a principle there. Uh, so the number of lynchings that have, has gone down. Hate crimes and murders of blacks have gone down. Non-lethal hate crimes against blacks have gone down. Whites' hostilities to blacks has decreased. Discrimination against all minorities has decreased. Rape has decreased. Domestic violence has decreased. Spousal murder has decreased. United States with, uh, U.S. states with corporal punishment has decreased. Approval of spanking has decreased. We're just getting nicer all the way around. Child abuse has decreased. School violence has decreased. States that have decriminalized homosexuality has gone up. Anti-gay attitudes uh, have changed dramatically. Anti-gay hate crime and intimidation has changed. And finally, I'm going to finish where I came, uh, where I started off with that moral arc bends toward freedom. That is, in that Flynn effect, I think there might be a moral Flynn effect, because the Flynn effect is for abstract reasoning and a scientific way of thinking in terms of, of cat- categorizing people into different categories and counting them as part of your group rather than the other group uh, is, a, is, a, is a, an abstract thought that you have to be able to, to, to conceptualize that. And it appears that people by generation are just getting better at that. I think probably through, there's much debate about this uh, and no agreement, but I think it's through exposure, through mass education, internet, television, travel, just more exposure to more ideas and the spread of science, scientific reasoning. It used to be this obscure area. Now it's this thing that everybody can appreciate. Uh, There are so many science books. You walk into a Barnes & Noble, it's just a huge section of science books. I get them all... Uh, For review at Skeptic and Scientific America, I can't keep up. Every day I get two or three brand new science books. Every day. There's hundreds and hundreds a year. And uh, and that's good. It makes it harder for us science authors to compete in the marketplace, but that's okay. It's good for everybody. So scientific thinking is more abstract. Abstract reasoning expands the evolutionary circle of sentiment. So the long-term goal then would be to spread liberal democracy, spread free trade, spread the Internet, and I, I sort of show it in a sequence. So oh, there's the well, there's the Flynn effect. You can see the, the actual data on the matrices and similarities of the IQ, not just the general IQ, especially the matrices and similarities. Anyway, I call it the moral Flynn effect. And so for millennia, we have been evolving toward a new civilization that I call 2.0, from the fission fusion groups of primates to the hunter gatherers, to uh, tribes of settled communities, to chiefdoms with the big man, to states, to empires to democracies, to liberal democracies, to liberal democratic capitalism, to the global interconnected community we're at right now, all the way up to hopefully a civilization 2.0 where the entire world is connected, all knowledge is free, and we make tremendous. That, to me, is the social singularity, where we have free minds and free markets, and then we truly open the world to all people. Thank you. Thank you. We've got just a couple minutes for questions. I see one hand over here. Mr. Shermer, great presentation. Um, two quick questions, one, one quick follow-up general. Um, has anything increased at all in, in terms of all the slides? Have you seen any sort of antisocial behavior increase? And have you seen increases in like virtual crimes, like cyber crimes ah. or financial fraud or things that, where people are abstracted? Right. Right. Uh, so like, like the global warming curve where there's little sawtooth uh, ups and downs where, you know, global warming, it was, it was cold the other day. You know, th- 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 there's always the little blips up and down. And you saw that in all those curves, little blips up and down. Uh, I've not seen any data curves for cyber crimes. There, it, it, there must be enough of a database to track that by now. I've not seen any. But, of course, that would have to go up from the invention of computers just by definition because the expansion of the, uh, of the market. Then it'll eventually go down as the anti-cyber terror crime technologies kick into place. Something like that. Question here on the left side, about six rows back. Hi, Bob Freeling with the Solar Electric Light Fund. The last image you showed, uh, the image of the world connected. Um, Right now we have about 1.6 billion people that don't have electricity, no lights in their homes, no way to charge cell phones or computers. 
So my question is, uh, what is it going to take to, to actually bring to fruition that idea of a totally yeah. interconnected world, and how can singularity uh, help? Yeah, great question. Well, first of all, I, I like the idea of that $100 a laptop. I, you know, let's just give them out to every, every, every village and every place. And Okay, well, they can't plug them in. Right, so we have to have in infrastructure. So you have really basic uh, things that have to happen in a third world country to lift it up. You have to have an infrastructure, roads, a banking system. If you keep your, like in Peru, I, I, uh, if they keep their, a lot of people keep their money in a tin can under the floor, floorboards. That's no banking system. Uh, you can't count on, they don't even have property rights. You can't buy a home and, and then somebody comes to squat on your home and you go, no, here's my deed. You can't, you can't come in here. They don't even have that in a lot of places in Peru. So there's like at least a dozen things that have to be put into place just to get it so where you could give them a $100 laptop. So the singularity thing, this is what I'm saying. We're not going to get there until the social, political, economic stuff happens. Fortunately, it is happening. Um, as Ray said, how many democracies were there? It, it, well, in 1900, there were zero liberal democracies in the world. Women couldn't even vote here until 1920. That's pathetic. But, but now there's like 96 liberal democracies. That's a lot. That's what you're, I don't think it's quite the linear law of accelerating turns, but we're getting there. All right. Unfortunately, we are out of time for questions, but a warm thank you for thank Dr. You. Michael Schultz. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.